Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Today I'd like to fill you in on the continuing saga of the bad capacitor in the Tektronix analog oscilloscope I'm working on. Oh, I should make the point that these videos are what did, rather than how to. I don't claim to be a great repair tech. You'll see several points in this video where I messed up, and I'm sure that some of you will be yelling at the screen. Sure, go ahead and vent your wrath in the comments. Every channel can use the engagement. When we left off, I'd tested the power supply, and I found an undervoltage on the negative 15 volt supply. I got a scope on it, and found there was a huge ripple. I managed to get access to the unregulated negative 26 volt supply that fed it, and found the same ripple. It appears the filter capacitor on that rail is bad. I managed, with some struggle, to remove the power supply from the unit. The power supply is encased in an aluminum chassis, and the next step is to get out the rectifier board. Before we continue, let me make a brief interruption. Many of you know that my content is never paywalled and is free for anyone to learn from. I never beg for money to support the channel. But I do ask something important, that you take care of one another. To that end, the advertising revenue from this YouTube channel goes to charity. My March 2025 payment has gone to the Get Fed Up campaign of Save the Children. The campaign has a single mission, fighting childhood hunger. Of course, that fight has more benefits, because the prosperity of a community depends on education, and you can't fill a child's brain when a child has an empty belly. But more important, I want children to be able to play and dream about their future without worrying where their next meal will come from. I know that Kevin's Cave people are a kind and generous lot, so I'm urging you to join me in supporting this organization, using the affiliate link up here, or down there, or at any rate somewhere nearby. I've set a relatively modest goal of 500 bucks. If even 1% of my subscribers were to give 10 bucks apiece, we'd meet that goal and feed a classroom of 30 hungry kids for a week. I hope that instead, we'll just crush it. Won't you help out today? The manual says that you first have to desolder the wires that go to the line cord and power switch. So out comes the soldering iron. Even after adding flux, I couldn't quite get the solder to flow until I added some fresh solder. The one ground wire was still a challenge. There's not much thermal relief between it and the chassis. The others pulled right out. Of course, I put tape on them with the wires numbered in order, in addition to filming this whole process so I can get it back together. Speaking of getting it back together, I also cleaned out the holes in the board with a solder sucker. I'll tidy the remaining blobs of solder with some braid later. Next, the manual says to pull out the four screws that hold the board in place. A Phillips screwdriver didn't give enough torque to bust them out. I applied penetrant and tried the impact driver once the penetrant had time to work. Two of the screws backed right out under the impact driver but the other two are well and truly frozen. Even another round of penetrant and more waiting didn't move them. Well, I won't let that defeat me. Time to roll out the big guns. I chucked a tiny left-handed bit into my drill. I'm using a left-handed bit so the cutting forces will tend to loosen the screw rather than driving it even tighter. Drilling a tiny hole down the middle of the screw will make it grip the threads less rigidly and can allow it to back out. I put some cutting oil on the bit and gave it a try.
Of course, I tried to clean up the oil and chips as best I could. Then I put a screw extractor in a tap handle and gave it a twist. Magic! And the other screw came out the same way. But the board didn't. There's no clearance for it. The flange on that back panel is covering too much of it. More screws to get out. Fortunately, Penetrant and Impact got them. Off came the back panel, revealing a pair of standoffs holding the board in place. Fortunately, they were easy to turn. The board still didn't come, and I'm beyond anything that the service manual discussed. Something seems to be holding it in place quite loosely. I'm guessing I also need to take out the four bolts on the bottom. They were a lot longer than I expected. They have some sort of plastic sleeving on them and phenolic shoulder washers under the bolt heads. Three more bolts just like the first one gave way to wrench and screwdriver. When the next to last one came out, I heard a disturbing clatter of something dropping inside the supply. Those bolts were holding little aluminum bars with tapped holes. And the power supply moved a tiny bit farther, letting me fish out the piece of aluminum that fell. But it still didn't come out. It looked as if I also needed to desolder the wires to the fuses on the back panel of the scope. While the iron was heating, I also tightened the connection to the heat sink. I'd loosened it, but I didn't need to. Now to desolder those wires. Pretty much the same drill as before. And at long last, the board is out. Time to go after that bad boy of a cap. The manual just gives the general advice to use desoldering braid. Really helpful. I hit it first with a solder sucker. And it's unbelievable how much it sucked out of some of those joints. but it didn't free the legs of the cap. I moved on to braid with lots of flux and a big screwdriver tip on the iron and an even bigger tip that I switched to off camera. I got out a lot more solder, but not enough. Those lugs are stuck. More flux and try again, rinse and repeat. Finally, I gave up on the idea of trying to reform the capacitor and decided just to get it out by cutting the lugs. Sometimes you have to do that. 
Because the can of the capacitor is such a huge heat sink that you can't get the joints hot enough to desolder. I managed to get two of the lugs with a flush cutter, and there was one wide one that I had to spend some time with a warning file off camera, paring it down to where I could get the cutter jaws around it. But the two lugs on the inside, I couldn't quite reach with anything. The can is loose enough that maybe I can heat them up and wiggle them loose. It's moving a little, little more. Got it, yay! And there's the bad boy that gave me all that trouble. Unfortunately, I've done some damage. I've torn away some of the PC board foil. And the lugs on the capacitor ran through little brass ferrules in the board that I've also yanked out. I'm guessing the tech needed to add these to pass shock and vibration testing on the militarized version of the scope. An elephant is a mouse built to mill spec. Fortunately, I don't think it's going to be much of a problem. The foil that I ripped doesn't actually do very much. It just connects two lugs of the can and an unpopulated place on the board for a fuse clip. That fuse is used on the commercial version of the scope, but not the military one. The two lugs are connected on the opposite side, and that foil runs farther, but it's intact as far as I can see, and that's the side I'll be soldering on. Pulling the three lugs that I cut off should be a lot easier. I can get into both sides of the board, and I don't have a huge aluminum cad wicking all my heat away. The repair is also going to be ugly, because once I got done with those two lugs, I tried to clean some excess flux with isopropyl alcohol, and I discovered that the board is lacquered, and the IPA stripped the lacquer. But the lacquer seems to be another bit of military overdesign. There's no corresponding protection for all the push-on connectors, so I'm still not too worried. Let's take a look now at that cap. Before I pulled it, the lettering was facing inward on that crowded board, and I couldn't get a good look at it. It's by Sprague. Good. Back in the day, Sprague's quality was first rate. 14,000 microfarads matches the schematic, but 25 volts DC? Let me review the video and look at the peak voltage I saw across it. 28.5 volts. If I remember my math right, 28 and a half is bigger than 25. That's not good. No wonder that cap failed. On the schematic, the unregulated supply is noted as 26 volts. 28 is close enough for an unregulated supply. That 25 volt cap can't be right. I suspect that someone else was here before me repairing the scope and put in the wrong voltage. It's the only Sprague tin can in the whole unit. All the others are Mallory. What's it say in the bill of materials? C811. 14,000 microfarads, 25 volts. Excuse me, Tektronics? Okay, this is getting weird. Let me compare this bill of materials and schematic with the one for the commercial version. Oddly, the commercial scope has differences in the supply voltages. It looks as if Tech put in a higher voltage power transformer in the military version. Maybe they needed it to run off 100 volt Japanese power or 400 hertz aircraft power or something. The commercial scope shows an 18 volt unregulated supply rather than a 26 volt one. The bill of materials shows the same 25 volt capacitor, but that's fine on an 18 volt supply. What about the companion capacitors on the plus 18 volt or plus 26 volt rail? There are a pair of these, and the commercial unit bill of materials has them at 9600 microfarads apiece, 25 volts. On the military side, the bill of materials also says 25 volts. But the capacitors in the unit are 9600 microfarads 30 volts. I think a 30 volt cap is marginal for a 28 volt supply, but Tetronics in the military probably thought it was fine. I suppose I should compare values on all these other electrolytics 
and make sure there aren't any other lurking monsters. I put everything on a spreadsheet. All the capacitances matched among all the places I checked. The military schematic showed higher working voltages on most of the unregulated supplies. The three capacitors on the 26-volt unregulated supplies are listed as 25-volt caps in the bill of materials, but the two non-failed ones in my scope are 30-volt caps. Just barely high enough, but high enough. The failed one is a 25-volt cap from a different manufacturer. So my best guess is that in the military unit, tech boosted the voltage on several of the power transformer secondaries. The boosted voltage was still within range of most of the caps, but three of them needed to be upgraded. The upgrades got made at the factory, but never made it into the bill of materials. Later on, some service person had to replace this cap, pulled out the 30-volt Mallory original, and soldered in a 25-volt Sprague unit instead. The overstressed Sprague managed to hold on for the time that I used the scope, but when I put it away for a couple of decades and then powered it on suddenly without ramping it up on a Variac, that was the end of the capacitor. It was valiant, but the overvoltage was just too much for it. Now I don't regret cutting the lugs and giving up on reforming the cap. Some bad boys just can't be reformed. I'm not going to find a replacement cap with that lug pattern. Not for anything other than an astronomical price, anyway. But I should be able to take a current production electrolytic and have a little round PC board made to receive it, with pins on it to fit the holes in the original PCB. The newer caps are mechanically smaller. If I get really ambitious, I might try to drill out the old cap and hide the new one inside to preserve the original appearance. But I probably won't bother. I'd be a lot more inclined to if the capacitor I was replacing were original. So next time in this series, I'll check with the distributor to see what's available, do the trivial PC board layout, and order some stuff. I hope you'll stay tuned for that. If only there were some way for my viewers to tell the YouTube algorithm that they want to be notified when that episode comes out. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye.